uh, good morning, uh, everyone who is here and who are online. Um, it was a real marathon yesterday of uh, beautiful, amazing conversations. And uh, we are excited today because we are meeting face to face and uh, the value of talking like this with all the side talks and gestures and it's beautiful. So we are talking about humanizing medicine. And um, I think uh, medicine, uh, as we saw in so many discussions yesterday, there are so many changing paradigms as we uh, to use that cliche uh, in medicine. And we have moved from what we uh, label as a very paternalistic kind of following medicine to something called shared decision making. Uh, what that means is that when a doctor um, is sitting with a person who has come to them for treating his or her illness or maybe discussing some health condition. I mean, the concept of patient has changed so much that I don't know how to address that person sitting in the space there. Um, there then the person needs to be informed about what choices are available to him or her, which means that uh, the concept of that disease has to be explained to the person in a manner that he can understand. So information in a manner that the person can understand, part one. Part two, the doctor should understand what the person is coming for, uh, what, what is his story. So there are two parts of understanding there. That is a huge, huge thing to ask for. So shared decision making involves all these steps. And today that is what we are going to start the discussion with. I hand over the mic to Mr. Rahul Malik. Uh, we are talking about listening spaces and shared decision making, all of which are components of this understanding or relationship build, building between a doctor and a patient, if I may call that. Great. Thank you very much, Bina. We are very glad to join you. And we have one of our panelists who will join us online. So uh, he unfortunately could not make it here. Uh, I think the goal of this uh, discussion is to just to understand what's that changing narrative uh, from being just responsive to patients needs, but to also being part of their story and what they've gone through. And what does that truly mean for a provider and the institutions in terms of how behavior needs to be changed, or there could be some elements of policy change around it. So I wanted to start by getting some introductions in. Uh, I'll start with you, Nandita, first. Thank you, Rahul. I'm Dr. Nandita Chakravarti. I'm a physician, primary care physician, uh, practicing in Gurgaon since 2006. And I'm also a certified wellness coach working towards preventive health care. Great. Thank you. Kavita? So my name is Kavita. I'm um, by qualification, I'm a child psychiatrist and I'm co-founder of an organization called Children First Mental Health Institute. Um, I think keeping in mind the, uh, the entire uh, theme of this conference, I'd like to say I'm more than that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm a human being. I'm, I'm deeply interested in learning more and deeply interested in the wider stories that we live within. So how, how medicine is changing during my lifetime, how my experiences as sometimes being a patient, because doctors fall sick, uh, or as a caregiver, uh, and what we can learn from all of that is, is and bringing that into practice is yeah. something that I'm very keen on. And um, Great, great. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Vivek Anand on the call, if he could introduce himself, Vivek. Thanks, Rahul, and uh, apologies that I'm not going to be able to uh, join all of you in person this morning. Uh, my name is Vivek Jha. I'm a kidney doctor. Uh, I'm a, so what it means is that I am a general physician, uh, but who has spent a disproportionate amount of his time treating patients with various kidney diseases. Uh, but uh, beyond that, I am a researcher. Uh, I have a deep interest in understanding the social and economic factors that influence uh, a patient's journey and also how uh, we as physician community and really the entire healthcare community respond to them, help them make decisions, and sometimes uh, bridge the 
a huge information gap that exists between providers and patients. Uh, the ability to be flexible and, and, and be responsive in a way that understands the values and preferences of the patients in front of us. And for us to realize that everyone doesn't have the same life goal and how we can help them achieve their life goals is something that has been of great interest to me over the last uh, uh, 20 years. And uh, these 20 years have been informed by the 20 years that came before that, uh, where, uh, you know, as, as a part of our growing up, our, our priorities were somewhat different. And that has been a process of learning, uh, which hope that we will be able to share a little bit with each other about. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Vivek. And I'll uh, introduce myself. Uh, my name is Rahul Malik. I'm the only non-doctor on this panel. And so maybe I'm going to be the one who's going to be asking some of the tough questions around, uh, uh, are you really humanizing your behavior towards me as a, as a patient? Uh, but as a quick background, I work in digital health uh, and I work in philanthropy. Uh, so uh, I basically look at a lot of public health, uh, look at how systems, health systems are set up and essentially how are you making sure that patient gets what they need. So that's a quick background about me. Uh, so we'll, what we'll do is we'll kind of structure this session in a, in a certain way so that we can have a very meaningful 45 minutes with all of you. Uh, we'll start with the, some patient stories or journeys or their own journeys from each of us, uh, very short. And then we we'll lead that into understanding how some of that is leading us into thinking through humanizing our engagement with patients. What are some of the things we think are good to do? And then we'll try and see if we have enough time for us to get into a few thoughts and ideas around how it could actually be shaped up both in terms of uh, behavior change and also in terms of potentially some policy changes which could happen. So uh, yeah, I'll get it uh, on the way. And then Anita, we could start with you. Okay, Back again. You. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm a physician, which means I did my MBBS, I did my MD. Uh, a typical journey started practicing in hospital and then started my private practice. And um, during uh, my MD, I was finishing my MD, I was diagnosed with an autoimmune condition. And uh, it was, a, I would say, a tap on my back from the universe to wake me up from my slumber of the conditioned mind of how a doctor's life is panned out. And I became a, immediately I became a patient and in a scenario where nobody knew how to, what to do. And I was too young to accept it. I thought if you are in one of the best institutes and your doctors around you and there's a diagnosis, there's a treatment. That's when I realized that how much we know and how much we are still learning. That opened up a new world for me and I was in a way forced to look at the entire medicine world in a different way. Um, I gathered my life and by the time uh, I was 35, I developed, I paralyzed my vocal cord. That was the second stroke, which I became silent for almost eight months. I didn't speak. So that gave me the opportunity to open up a new skill, which is listening. And uh, strangely, when you don't speak, people don't speak to you. You have to tell them that I can still hear, you can speak. They also start writing or whispering. It's a regular human behavior. That really made me understand that how much we are not listening in a normal routine life. But as a doctor, I think that's really not fair for the person who's come to you at such a vulnerable stage. So that opened up something very, very profound for me about listening what is not said, about listening what the person is scared to be vulnerable and saying. And that's when I started working towards preventive healthcare. How can we make uh, people aware and educate so that they could not, they can be more empowered, more, they have more intelligence and courage to deal with their own life, health, and wellness. Great. That's an inspirational story. And just for everybody to know that somebody's run 30 kilometers today morning, and uh, it's this person who just spoke. 
So that's truly, truly inspirational. Kavita, love to hear from you. So I, I uh, grew up uh, in, in a family where one of my parents uh, is a doctor. My father is a doctor. Um, and my mother had mental illness. Uh, so there was both a patient as well as a doctor in the family as I was growing up. Um, and I think my journey has been more about also finding out that there are spaces and caregivers and children within families where if there is a chronic illness in the parent, what is the impact on, on the rest of the family? And where is the space within medicine or outside of medicine in our society that can address that or that child can approach? Uh, and I realized that that, that vacuum that we, that we grew up in as children, where one didn't know where to go. Um, and it was, and while my father was a doctor himself, um, mental illness and mental health is still something which often uh, the family has to sort of deal with in a vacuum um, because it's not just about medication. Uh, it's not just about treatment. It's, a, it's about a whole lot of other things that are developing and going on. And just small examples of if, if uh, my mother would have a psychotic episode, as children, we knew that day there would be no food on the table. And these are very small things, but in childhood and how it impacts childhood and as you grow up, how it impacts you is something that stayed with me. And I think in retrospect, one of the reasons that I became a psychiatrist uh, was what shaped me during my childhood. And um, I often feel in retrospect now that maybe uh, I'm still attempting as a child psychiatrist to listen to uh, that child in each of my sessions, uh, that child that didn't have a listening ear. Uh, and I hope that as we go along, we are able to, uh, and I think it, uh, in my journey, then it, it became about, it's not just about that one family. It's not just about me. There exists a void in society and we don't have those spaces in our ecosystem. And I think that's what led me or encouraged me to go on a journey of uh, making something more than just a, an individual based practice and to look at a health system or a mental health solution for the zero to 25 age group. And I think that in terms of medicine and where medicine sees its patient or the person they treat um, can be can we include the child? Can we include children? Uh, not just as passive recipients of treatment, which is what often happens. The child is brought into the clinic, uh, whether it's a mental health condition or not. Um, so I think the quest became more and more about highlighting the need that children have, whether they're part of a family, whether they are ill themselves. Um, and, and so I think that's, that's something that I'm still, um, hopefully attempting to do and we'll carry on doing. Thank you for that. Um, this makes me think that, uh, you know, while I, we look at doctors as non-doctors, as people who are there to listen to us, but there, there are stories behind them as well, which contribute to their empathy towards patients. And I'm glad you shared that story, Nandita. Uh, Vivek, if you can hear us, would love to get your story. Thanks, Rahul. And uh, look, I, I don't have uh, the kind of personal connect with illness uh, that uh, Nandita and Kavita shared just now. Uh, but my story is relatively simple uh, growing up, you know, uh, it's uh, of an aspirational middle class family. And uh, in, in those years, uh, one of the things that you aspired to was perhaps to become a doctor. And I was fortunate to get into um, uh, you know, this stream. And then eventually I got into PGI, which is one of the uh, leading uh, institutions to do my postgraduate training. And life became all about uh, uh, you know, going from day to day, making sure that you, you do what you need to. And uh, while as a resident uh, working in a busy hospital, I later realized, uh, not at that time, because at that time, I don't think that uh, we were actually trained to think in, in that manner, nor did we have any mind space, uh, really, because uh, as I said before, you are too busy just making sure that the day passes without you making mistakes 
or there being any disaster in, in the wards. So it both humanizes you, but also dehumanizes you at the same time, because patients are people who, who, who are in the way, so to speak, uh, if I might be brutal, really, uh, in, in the way of you just getting through your day, right? Uh, and uh, for me to be able to understand that each patient comes there, not because uh, not because they are uh, visiting a, a mall or a shop to uh, buy something, but they're, they're there only because they have no choice, really, uh, in most instances, especially in, in an institution like PGI. And for us to be able to understand what is going, uh, going through their minds and uh, the impact that the illness is having on, on their entire lives, uh, uh, we, we now know that... Uh, medical care is associated with catastrophic healthcare expenditure, but that's just one little bit. I think it becomes really very reductive when we talk about medicine in that way. The emotional toll and the, uh, and the toll on the families is, is untold and it's massive, which we don't realize. And then I went into, uh, into as I said, study of kidney diseases. And uh, there also, uh, when you are doing your clinic, uh, you, your goal is just to finish your clinic. And uh, again, patients are there because you have a clinic and, and you have to dispose of those patients in uh, as quick a time as possible so that you can take care of other things, right? So uh, I, I'm sure that everyone in India has experienced this in, in public sector hospitals, so I'm not saying anything new. But at that time, you didn't register, one doesn't register this, but as I, uh, as I finished my training and I became a faculty member, slowly it started dawning on me uh, that these are human beings and uh, when I was studying kidney diseases, so uh, patients with kidney disease, eventually when the kidneys fail, uh, they have to be put on a treatment called dialysis. Some of them are able to get uh, kidney transplantation. Now, that is something uh, which, which is a life-changing decision uh, for, for a large number of people. And why people choose to go on dialysis and what are their motivations for being on dialysis? And it's only later that I realized that everyone who goes on dialysis has a different life goal. Some people want to stay on dialysis just to live, live long enough to see their daughter get married, right? Uh, other people are on dialysis because they still have uh, a, a growing family and they have to feed them and they have to, they have to basically make sure that they have a job that they are able to do. Uh, and so the way we provide dialysis to person A versus person B has to be different, taking into account their choices. And there, there can be uh, numerous scenarios. And this is a movement which the this brings me back to the initial point that was raised, the point of shared decision making. So how do you provide dialysis to a, a patient it is now recognized to be a prime example of a process where shared decision making is critical. Uh, that the treating community and the patient and their families, they need to sit together and decide uh, what how dialysis should be given really. And uh, the treatment of dialysis is not a one size fits all solution. And this, this was a process of evolution. And slowly I realized when I was a faculty member and slowly as uh, uh, you know, I just became senior, my, uh, my, uh, my hair turned gray, that I was actually spending more time talking, listening to patients and, and solving their social problems. And the social, social determinants of health were perhaps much more important than the medical issues. Uh, medical issues for sure were important, no question. That was the reason they came. But why did they came at different stages in their lives? Uh, we often lamented and, and we, we, as a resident, I thought it was okay to, to shout at a patient uh, saying that you should have come earlier. Uh, but it's only later I realized that the patient did not have any choice. The patient could not have come earlier because of a variety of reasons. And so all of that uh, took me into an area of research. And now I spend a lot of my time researching these issues, trying to find out what, why and how the socioeconomic determinants uh, affect a patient's life course. And what can we do? How can we involve these people into uh, not only providing their treatment, but also as a healthcare community, uh, we develop these treatments through research. So we involve these people into research because they need to have a say in how the researcher community finds a treatment which is eventually going to affect them. So that's the, 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 the circle of life uh, as, as it has run for me so far. And I will stop here and maybe we can come to some of these points later. Sure. Uh, thank you, Vivek. So, you know, your experiences make me think back at my experiences and 
relatively how privileged i've had a life coming from an army background and generally being uh, you know having access to healthcare and health facilities uh, which uh, i guess most modern people uh, urban people expect to but i think my my life and career took a turn about 8 years back when i after spending 17 years in the consulting corporate consulting world i decided to enter uh, the philanthropy and social sector and then i started looking at a set of people who i had probably not looked at as closely in my life and these were people who were the the poor and the rural and whose access to healthcare was completely different from my access to healthcare and uh, for things we take for granted i i stay in gurgaon uh, i've got i am at a radius within a radius of 5 kilometers from top the top 5 hospitals there and uh, that for me is just taken for granted but then i back in 2013 when i visited satar katia in bihar and i went into this village where i met the people who were uh, a minority community in india and backward within that minority community as well and they were at the furthest end of the village with the least amount of access to anything uh, which you could expect even water and let alone health facility so the health facility was uh, uh, you know a bridge too far for them and it made me realize that if i were to be in the same place this was 2013 in 1947 uh, when we got independence life wouldn't have been any different for those people there back then also so nothing has changed for that world whereas for us in the modern world with all the access and facilities and then every time i used to come uh, after that experience and subsequent experiences of visiting such places in both up and bihar uh, back to my urban life and go and visit a physician and uh, i would probably be at a behavior where i would probably give far more regard to that physician because i knew i had access to that person far more than the people i had met so my life stories have been uh, in the most of, most of them in the last 8 years have been cultivated around humanizing medicine for both the privileged and the underprivileged is an equally important thing to do uh, i went to karnataka once uh, to see some of the field work and some of the work in the facilities and i went to a public health facility and i saw that the doctor and as vivek was alluding to uh, you know you're not trained that way and sometimes you probably feel that the patient is in your way i actually noted the time the doctor had less than one and a half minutes per patient uh, and i do not know in one and a half minutes or two minutes um, what do you how do you even humanize that engagement right i was looking at the digital system they were using and which was wow you progress and you have a system but it was nothing but entering the patient with his id okay what problem do you have for anything and everything i think the prescription was some amoxicillin <laughs> and it was just instantly given out because you had one and a half minutes before the next person came in so i think my experiences have really really made me think through this both from the perspectives of the haves and the have nots but yeah i want to come back uh, based on what you've said and your stories and kavita i wanted to really uh, you know start with you with the organization you have set up and you're working in the psychiatry space uh are there things there where you you've now started realizing that we need to do things so differently when it comes to patient care and especially mental health uh and if you can bring in some context of how you think because i think this is not just an urban problem right it's it's equivalently prevalent everywhere that would be great sure so uh, i i think that's a topic in itself but i will try and summarize whatever my learning has been and bring out a couple of salient points um so we we uh, we work in the 0 to 25 year old space um uh, and this is a really vast space so when we started our organization in 2009 um uh, as a separate organization outside of a hospital one of the biggest things that that was our learning that prompted us to make something in the community was that children coming to a acute hospital were themselves getting traumatized by the actual process of visualizing seeing something that they need not see with the kind of concern they had come in with and many of the young uh, young people we met at that point of time 
in a hospital setting would say, why do I have to come here? Why do I have to come to a place where I'm seeing people who have been in accidents, coming through the trauma unit, coming through, and I'm, I'm seeing different kinds of people. Do I really need to show a six-year-old all of that when they are themselves either in pain or have a concern and are coming there with the view that they are going to get help? So I think one of the biggest things that I uh, started recognizing and our organization started recognizing was that we need a separate space for children, which is appropriate for children, especially children who have mental health difficulties, but not just those, because how children interpret the environment and the cues that they are receiving is something that I don't think medical facilities or hospitals are paying much attention to or have thought or have kept in the mind space when this has been constructed either as a service or as an infrastructure. So I think that was one of our biggest realizations. It needs to be in the community. It needs to be welcoming. It needs to be something that the child feels good to come to. So whether it is the colors or the way it is constructed or it is the person who is sitting as soon as you enter, because uh, oftentimes in medical hospitals or in services, the administrative staff is the front face. However, they are not the most trained. We are not spending enough time in helping them receive an anxious family. Um, so the first experience of the family as well as the child is the face of the front desk person or the guard. And I think to be able to understand that uh, medicine is going to be about the entire experience or treatment or management is going to be about the entire experience is something that dawned on us as we went along, which is, which is then how we constructed the clinic. We figured out that you need a little bit of books. You have to have toys. You have to have trained personnel who are meeting you right then and there before you're going to meet the doctor. Um, one small thing that, um, that, that I'd like to say, which is, sounds very small, but which is a difference in mind space. So all the hospitals that I've ever been to, um, you sit outside in the waiting area and either your name is called or your timing or your number is called. And the doctor is sitting in almost an invisible space beyond the door. You don't see the doctor before that. You're not, you know, and you don't know what's going on inside and the doctor doesn't see you in the waiting area. So, you are then escorted in and oftentimes the previous patient or family is just walking out. And what you are getting to see is the faces of that family as they're walking out. And that's how you're entering the room. And already in this entire structure, one realized how much of inequality in terms of power. It's almost like the doctor sitting inside a fortress. Yeah. And you can't access it. So your power equation right then there is, is changed. Um, so one of the small things that we started doing was that, that, well, it's small, but I go out and escort my patient in and everyone in our team does that. Every professional in our team will go out, will speak to them, greet them outside, give them a smile and escort them in. And this is something that our clients, our families have come to expect that I don't need to do anything. I'll wait here. Doc will come out and get me on the right time. And it takes three minutes extra. but uh, I think we've made a conscious decision that we, we do it. So that's about the infrastructure, et cetera, of services. The other bits and pieces are, I keep aside an hour the first time. Um, and this is again, something that was talked down a lot when we started, everybody said, how are you going to run a practice? If you're going to keep an hour, that means you can only see what, six, seven, eight patients a day, eight families a day. But we said that, how can I expect someone to start talking to me about their life, about their mental health, about some of their very personal, um, uh, you know, sort of inner world, if I don't uh, let them have that space? Um, and that, that's how we work. We work with 50 to 50 minute to one hour sessions. The least amount of reviews is usually half an hour. There's nothing less than that. Um, so I think these are structural changes, which initially everybody told us are not going to work. But I think if we start looking at at least mental health differently, and we provide ourselves the, the chance to make structural changes in the planning right from the start, I think we've understood that that leads to much better outcomes in the long run. Yeah. Yeah. And 
what used to be called really chronic diseases where you had to keep coming back to the doctor or to the uh, therapist for three years, four years has started re reducing because enough time for shorter term, yeah. but enough time in the moment is being given. Yeah. So I think that's, that's my uh, uh, little bit from the practical side that, that the design and the thinking of how the service is to be provided may need a major change sometimes. And ultimately, because I know now that I have an hour, that's how my day is structured. I'm also not in a rush. Hmm. And I know how to utilize with time, and it's been you know, several years now, I know how to utilize that hour to bring in shared decision-making, bring in the family, bring in the possibilities, options, and there's enough time to discuss. Yeah. So I'll, I'll stop yeah. here for now. And no, thanks. I mean, it's, it's made me think about so many things. Uh, doctors becoming busy, doctors, uh, and as Dr. Gore, I, I was, uh, you know, seeing the video of yesterday's sessions, said that, how do you balance time management? And he, he made a statement, good doctors have become the victims of their own success because they probably have far more patients queuing up for them. And then even if they want to, they don't have that kind of time. And I'm amazed at, uh, and this concept of doctors having personal assistants is relatively, I think, what, 10, 15 years old, maybe not more than that, right? And it's amazing that how many of the personal assistance numbers I have on my phone, besides the doctor's number, because I need to get access to that doctor and I know that I'll have to make sure because they are extremely busy. Um, you talked about this power equation. I mean, that's huge. Escorting your patient out, if you can do that in today's time and age, is a huge, huge thing. And imagine what it does for the patient. Anita, when we, we were chatting before this session, you spoke about how uh, this whole time management thing and how do you give more uh, to each than less to more, right? So what are your thoughts on that? That's such a beautiful way to put it, you know, like um, what bothered me my initial days of the revised practice when I started was that I I did not, I could not see myself as a provider, something that power equation that I have something which I'm giving to somebody who's receiving that equation really changed in my mind somewhere at a subconscious level I did not see I mean you know the the sense organs how what you listen and how you see it changes the complete inner voice of your mind so when I was not able to speak I had the time and the and everything to just listen and when you are listening you can listen to the vulnerability which is not spoken of and that's when you can see certain things which you are not able to see. Because I was already knowing when the patient sits and starts talking about one week ago I traveled and then I started having this pain. So I'm already making a chart and diagnosing it. I'm already, it's not this, it is this, this is it, this is it. So how to stop that automatic thinking and just be with the person for a little while so that you walk with him the person in his world what happened in last one week and then maybe give a treatment which is not uh, treating only the discomfort but also leaves him with some kind of an education or an awareness so that he does not land up to the same space again. I always keep telling my patients that if you're coming back to me for the same illness again and again then I'm not doing a good job. Because if you have been to me twice for the same thing, that means you're not understood. I'm not able to educate you that how you cannot land in this again, right? So let's say if you have a severe reflux issues and you have to attend a wedding, you should know what to do, what to eat, how to manage it. So that post wedding, you are not 100% sitting in my clinic, you know? So I think that is that approach needs time. Yes. Many of my patients and the community I live in that WhatsApp group or whatever mail group, you have these lines that she's too busy. You will not get an appointment and I completely understand that. But I do not want to uh, 
um, not go through that process with one person and do a sub uh, something which I don't agree with kind of a practice with four people and in the end of the day not feel that I've done my job. I think I just uh, want every um, provider, healthcare provider, to understand that we have a vision, which is a word I use is drishti, that you can see something which depends on what you are thinking. Mm. And a listening, which is not the words, it's also the facial expression and the hands and the how the patient is sitting. You have to see how the, I've seen my husband sitting in front of a doctor and I'm like, why is he so tensed? And once you step out, I said, you understood what he said. He said, I, I didn't listen a word. You were there. I am sure you must have. I'm, I'm like, imagine this is so close. So I understand the stress and the anxiety. And that has really impacted the way I uh, walk in my practice. Well, that's great. I always say that it's uh, two people who are supposed to take care of you is doctors and cops. And you kind of uh, are scared in front of both of them. Um, and you shouldn't be, uh, but for some reason you are. Um, I want to come to you, uh, Vivek. Um, you, you know, this time management thing is not going to solve for itself, right? Uh, and I, I think at some point in time, it's going to be very individual based. How individual? I don't know how can some of this get institutionalized? Can you've spoken about the way how social determinants of health are important? Uh, you know, how some of the work you do as a nephrologist on dialysis is such a great example of uh, shared health decisions. Do you think we can, we can start institutionalizing some of this behavior in the medical community in any way right from the time you, you know, you are early residents or even when you are getting trained to be a doctor? Absolutely, uh, Rahul, thanks. And, and I wouldn't repeat the inspirational examples that uh, both my colleagues have just given. Uh, but just to add one more thing in in my I, I as I said I spend most of my time in research but I do have a, a, a practice still and one more thing that I do is that uh, after a patient has spoken with me I ask them to go back go outside sit and perhaps think a little bit and if they have any follow-up questions come back uh, to me uh, during the same visit you know uh, so that and it's really important for me that the patient doesn't go back with any unanswered questions, at least during that visit. And I, I make sure that I ask them that question. Do you have any more questions that you wanted to ask, but uh, but have not been able to? So, you know, just make sure that I do it. Now, coming back to your specific question, Rahul, I think that's critical. One of the uh, issues that I, as now as a researcher, I am thinking increasingly about how to institutionalize this practice in, in, uh, in my colleagues. And uh, one of the biggest barriers is, uh, is our own community, I have to say. Uh, and uh, the, the paternalistic approach to practice of medicine, uh, it, it is ingrained in our system. And we will need to really work together to make sure that we, we address this issue. Uh, I, I often hear this from, uh, from people who are otherwise extremely well respected in their fields. And, uh, uh, you know, they, 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 they say, and this is, as I said before, this is the approach I had when I was a resident, that I will, the, I will tell the patient what I think is good for him or her, right? And uh, what is not good for, they, it, I know what is best for them, you know, that kind of approach. And how do you change that? It requires uh, increasing education and it, this education needs to start. Uh, and we hear noises from the National Medical Council that this will now happen even in MBBS uh, curricula, but, uh, but we have to really see how that happens. We also have to make uh, increasing connect with our partners, uh, the non-physician healthcare providers that we have in, in the communities. These informal providers, they can be great allies. Uh, we often take them as adversaries or competitors. Uh, that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. I know that this is a contentious issue, and it often creates uh, uh, often often creates strong divides. Uh, but we need to work together as as communities to make that happen. And then finally, as I said, we need to involve patients into or or community members, patients, families, and other stakeholders into the research that we do to generate that evidence. Uh, there is a, a strong movement now in including in research outcomes that are not just important outcomes, thought 
you know, thought by the physicians, but we ask the patient, what is important to you? And we should do research to identify how can we make it most likely that that outcome will be achieved, right? So for example, uh, as I, I'll give you another example from uh, my own field of the field of kidney diseases, we often as physicians think that the most important goal is to increase the number of years that a patient lives, right? But for many patients, that may not be the goal. You know, they don't necessarily want to live very long. Uh, they, as I said, they have some other life goals. Uh, their goal is to have a, 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 a life in which uh, their quality of life is good. You know, howsoever long that may be, it doesn't have to be necessarily that they have to live till 80 with the poor quality of life. And, uh, you know, they, they are more worried about fatigue. They're worried about getting good sleep. They're worried about uh, just achieving their life goals and life participation. Are they able to, uh, for some people, just go out and play with their grandchildren, right? I mean, those could be their life goals. And then we, we tailor their treatments according to th those life goals. And this is not an easy message to, uh, to convey to all our colleagues, but we need to continue to work on it as, uh, as the researcher community and, uh, uh, and a community of practitioners also. So uh, looking at research also uh, away from the sterile, sterile environment of research where it is thought of as experimentation, we have to make research more participative. And this is not, uh, this is not something that, uh, that is being done with, for the benefit of some uh, outside uh, esoteric community, but we will do it in a participative manner so that researchers are actually com composed of uh, the people who are being researched upon, so to speak, you know? So I think that all, all of that, it will take a, a while, but we need to get there eventually. Great. Thank you for that. And I, and I also know that your jobs are far more harder now because you have some uh, a competing doctor called Google, which you uh, constantly compete with with patients coming in and saying that, hey, I read something out there and maybe this is what, but I must also admit that recently it helped me in, in one case where I, I could actually inform somebody's decision-making. Uh, but no, this is, I think the point you touch upon on informal providers is massive. Uh, you know, three fourths of India's health spend is in the private sector and a bulk of that health spend is with informal providers, which we don't as much care about or know about. And we think that they're out there for whatever reasons they are, and they shouldn't be. But there's enough research also done to say that if they're trained and educated in a certain way about patient care, um, you know, we might just have some ways in which uh, India's huge uh, patient need is addressed uh, rather than just shunting them away. But yeah, that's a different topic and debate. I this is we've got five minutes, so I'll just take closing comments. I'll just start with myself. <clears throat> Uh, you know, as a as somebody who's been closely associated in this in the public health world, uh, the first lessons I learned when I joined the Gates Foundation eight years ago was that all lives have equal value, and uh, your your health or your access to care should not be determined by the accident of your birth, uh, whether you're privileged or unprivileged. So I'm so glad that in this session we are, we have people who truly believe in that and who want to make sure right from the examples you cited of walking your patient out yourself to what you said, Vivek, around asking them the questions, including the question that have I answered every question of yours, goes such a long way in terms of building that connect and making sure that that conversation is far more meaningful. I recollect my conversation with Bina and she was, I after a while, I started feeling that I'm taking more time of her than she should be giving me uh, because there might be other people waiting. But, you know, it was probably one of the greatest conversations I've had with a doctor, which looked at my story and my entire thing rather than just for that particular purpose I had come to that doctor for. But, yeah, I just want to take last uh, closing thoughts from any of you. This is just open in no particular order uh, of, uh, you know, on this subject of listening, uh, patient stories and shared health decisions. I'll just uh, summarize in one line. I think uh, when we are learning uh, anatomy, physiology, and pharmacology, and all the other subjects during our MPPS, like most of the other syllabus, other curriculum, we should have something called as, I don't know, humanizing or human resource or whatever you want to call it, where we are 
taught to stop making that flow chart when a patient walks in and stop how can we stop being so automatic in our thinking and diagnosis and the specification of treatment something is beyond that which is spending a few vulnerable moment with the patient and that should be a part of a first which should start from first year in mbbs and it should be a compulsory subject to get the best score i i completely agree with you there nadita and um is it first i mean i don't know what the curriculum looks no, like no i don't know i don't think so it's there still there it wasn't there in our time i'm sure it's not there no no it's it's not there as far as we are aware um um i think i i just like to say that we've talked about quite a few different things today and uh, it may sound like a very big and complex solution that when when we talk about healthcare for india um but i think i take hope from the fact that i see over a period of time that a conference like this can exist we can speak about it that there are individual practitioners so many of them who have come up with various kinds of solutions that are working and that we are being able to talk about it i think the the call of the hour now is to get together it's it's not about practicing in silos it's about exchanging this information with each other making healthcare more contextual because i think diseases have progressed it's, we live in a very different world the prevalence or the larger prevalence of diseases today are not necessarily the acute ones these are the ones you will live with and the entire demography of disease treatment health quality of life all these words have come in um at a much later stage than let's say 40 years ago 50 years ago where healthcare was a very different um proposition i think and it was never called healthcare you know, my father is a doctor he is now 90 his concept of being a doctor and my concept of being a doctor is vastly different and i think we need to be able to but i don't think medical education has changed that much so <laughs> i think we need to catch up but i think there's so much hope there are people who are doing beautiful stuff it's about platforms like this and it's about getting together and doing it in a much more collective fashion and i have great hope um starting from the morning today and yesterday i i feel we're on the right track thank you like closing thoughts from you thanks uh, rahul so I, i what i would like to add is that this movement needs to continue as uh, uh, as has just been said and this needs to become institutionalized uh, this uh, cannot uh, just be limited to a uh, two or three day conference and then we all go back to doing what we were i think all uh, medical conferences all specialty conferences should have sessions around uh, patient oriented care uh they they do, and they should include humanities that uh, as uh, nandita just said and kavita also agreed that we need to include a curriculum on humanity in medical education uh we need to uh, make sure that we in measure quality now uh, based on patient parameters so we have now nabh and things like that i think uh, those accreditation parameters should include uh what is the what are the patient satisfaction scores uh you know uh, not just at the level of the hospital but also at the level of uh, whatever we think is important metric uh, unless we institutionalize it it will not happen uh it remains a good idea uh, we feel very happy and 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 sort of satisfied we we go back self satisfied that we have done our bit we have talked uh, we have spoken about great things uh but to uh, to make sure that it gets implemented we have to institutionalize it that's the that's the goal we need to move towards and for that we need to generate evidence we need to we need to have guidelines we need to implement those guidelines and make sure that people are judged uh, on the base i i don't mean it in a bad way but uh, but it needs to be included in in the various criteria that uh, that are currently used uh, to determine how well or how badly we are all doing as a community yeah yeah so no, thank you for that and you know i i was recently thinking about if i have an adverse patient experience what's my recourse uh, where do i go who do i talk to and i'm not saying in a very serious way but i probably think there is something i need to escalate it to and i think even for the topmost hospital in gurgaon recently uh, we did not have a great patient experience i wanted it to be heard i didn't want there to be any major thing about it but i wanted somebody to hear it in that hospital because at the end of the day 
when i the world i come from uh, the the corporate world you still felt that you had some avenues to go to somebody so i said okay what works these days uh, social media so and i didn't want to go to social media and put it up publicly because i thought i need to first individually reach out to them but i took a direct message on social media and i reached out to them i did not hear back instantly then i heard back after 2 3 days and i'm still waiting it's about 3 weeks that they're supposed to take more action on what i had given as a feedback so you know this whole patient satisfaction thing i think really at an individual doctor level when you are engaging i don't think you have a choice but to sort of give the feedback that to that doctor themselves but when you're dealing with an institution that doctor is part of i don't see institutional mechanisms being set up like a grievance redressal or something like that where you can go so anyway that's another thing where we could uh, talk on and about but i just wanted to close this session by saying that we've got some great sessions coming up for the rest of the day uh, the next one i think is on a, a very important area uh, one which you don't want to want it to affect you breaking bad news uh, to patients how that works there there are other sessions around systematic barriers to a good doctor patient engagement and there is a session on technology as well so hopefully uh, the people who have logged in it's a sunday but this is probably the best use of a sunday uh, one could have um, i have not taken a bath that early in the morning on a sunday but i had to do today so to that thank you very much thank you anita thank, thank you kavita you. thank you vivek for joining us in spite of uh, you know some challenges at home if you can have a quick Oh, we have a Q and A. Oh, of course, we have uh, we have about five hundred people here in the audience, so we could have. I think, uh, <laughs> um, so I hope there are some physicians. Abhi subh subh, you have said that many people. I hope that there are people who can watch this. If not today, good good thing about having this digital recording is that you can watch it any time, and it is for all of them to uh, listen to it and. feel connected is why i think as and actually rahul you had uh, very rightly mentioned that there is one sector which we have not addressed which is the public sector here yeah okay so um i'll come here and ask that question yesterday we had uh, someone who is working as uh, head of medicine department at government medical college elahabad prayagraj mm. and uh, in that same panel we had doctors from us and uk and we were talking about uh, self preservation and how well we know our patients mm. so it started with this whole conversation about time she started okay so on a good day you're talking about 10 patients you're talking 100 medicine opd at prayagraj where the slip is of 1 rupee there are 5000 patients wow and in some opds there are there is no one to assure there is no all of them are inside and in that moment how do you know your patients she spoke about that and it was it was an eye opener so we we could think about our days in medical colleges and i think we have these kind of experiences mujhe lagta hai hum woh wala part unless we address those doctors all doctors have come from that yeah absolutely everybody has done something so yeah and even even in public uh, private sectors in corporates we do not have control over the number of patients unfortunately we are the ones who have taken a thing and moved away from an institution and we have our own private practices right we have our own solo practices where we regulate time and whatever we want to space is in our hands but uh, as you said the feedback if you give a feedback to the institution it immediately results in a punitive action towards the doctor who has no control yeah. over the time and right. the space so where is the control that the doctor has there so this is for all the physicians and i think others can also join in and something on you know one of the major problem is basically uh, the the sheer number that you know the doctors are required to be mm. and uh, it is actually very easy to talk about humanizing every even the doctor is a human every uh, and a doctor is a very sensitive person although he may not put up that face in front of a patient but uh, you know we have to it is a race against time you know the point the numbers that you see is overwhelming it is impossible to control the numbers when you have a limited opd of maybe 10 patients 15 patients you can manage but beyond 50 is impossible to manage and yeah. there are days when you have to deal with that number even in, in a corporate yeah. setup and the problem basically is because there are not enough medical facilities 
So everything boils down to that, and that is actually destroying the relationship between patient and the doctor. That mismatch of expectation. The doctor expects a lot from the patient. The patient also expects a lot from the doctor, and they are not able to meet out that expectation because communication needs time. Yeah. Needs time. Yeah. There is such a huge pressure on secondary and tertiary care because we have a pretty much a dysfunctional primary care system. So, if you have a headache, then you have no access to primary care. Access hai nahi, so, you go to a hospital. Jate. Right? And then that puts that load on that doctor who's treating everybody from very basic things onto things which are very, very serious to take care of. But for them, every patient is a patient, right? They have to look at it. And our primary care in a private sector environment is virtually non-existent, right? We can say we have independent doctors who might be affording you that, but they're not too many, right? And that's why if you see any of the big hospitals in Gurgaon, and if you walk in there, and some of you are, have worked there in the past, the, the whole load from peri-urban and rural areas is coming on to this because of the fact that we don't have the systems at that level to take care of them. There are very interesting models of social entrepreneurship which have come up. Uh, 40 kilometers from Gurgaon, I went to see Karma Healthcare's uh, clinic. It's fantastic. It's in a village where there's a, there's a doctor on call, but there is a full-time attending nurse available there for many basic things which can be taken care of and you can use telemedicine to reach out to a doctor where needed. That can help alleviate some of that pressure which goes up. But yeah, this is a, this is a risk and a danger we have of, I mean, our doctor shortage in India is, is publicly known. Uh, I don't think we're bridging that anytime soon. So, I don't know. Do you think that we'll get enough medical colleges out there and... No, no, so I, I, I don't agree with this. There are previously there were a lot of uh, uh, means um, this gap between the patients and doctors. See, when we were in medical college, that time roughly ten thousand doctors used to come thirty years back out of the medical every year. But now I see, see, there is a medical college even in a district. District. So in uh, you don't think there's a doctor-patient gap right now in our. Uh, so, so, so you will see in next five or ten years, I think the doctors would be like the engineers, and then there, there will be no job to be done for that. I so, so, so this is uh, actually if you see the place where there were five medical colleges, there are 20 medical colleges, and most of the people who are getting trained, they are doctors trained, they don't have facilities, no faculty, very mm. poor. So, I don't know whether in the Sheer number it will increase, whether it will increase the quality of the uh, your treatment or it will reduce mm. your quality. I don't know. There are a lot of private medical colleges, and can, anyone can get into the medical uh, nowadays by mm. just paying it and, and going outside. So, whether you are really want that sort of medical facilities where the quality would go down further, uh, that's difficult to and and one thing I, I am not uh, I whether I am not sure I should make this comment. You are talking. Is karma healthcare by by I think one of the Ayurvedic doctors who preaches this. Uh, no, it's not Ayurvedic. No, it's not Ayurvedic. So, 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 so medical the 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 gap is uh, now. If you see in the Gurgaon, how many means there will be plenty. Gurgaon is a different place, but if you go to the smaller cities also, there are doctors' clinic everywhere. So people have this thing they want to go to a see India. There's a problem of. Uh, uh, maybe a, a, a structure or a faith on a particular system. So people like to go to particular doctors. So that is why there are doctors who are very busy yeah. and the people go to them. A lot of people want to go to the same doctor. That's why there is a disconnect. But there are doctors maybe mm. there who are not seeing so many patients. Yeah. And, and because there is a systemic in US or in any developed country, if you go, there is a hospital, you have to go to hospital, you will meet whatever doctor is there and he will treat you according to the guidelines for whatever the system is there. But in India, mm. that is lacking and there is concentration on particular doctor or particular yes. hospital where a lot of people want to go and they go there. And then this is a, uh, that's how we have sure. this gap. Sure. If I may, um, I think uh, I mean, all of us, most of us have, like Meena said, worked in government hospitals, seen what the state is, what the ratio is, not just in terms of time, but in terms of the daily grind of seeing X number of hundreds of patients every day, 
yeah i think i'm grateful also that uh, i got to have that experience because i don't think you get that kind of clinical experience and clinical acumen anywhere else i worked in the uk i've come back they see three patients a day their their clinical acumen is very different and they are protocolized so just having money doesn't seem to be the answer it's not that the nhs doesn't have problems it does i think the question that i finally came down to is the problems with india's healthcare system whether it is access affordability standardization all of that are so immense that if i you or 20 of us sit down we will end up with a whole host of problems that nobody's got an answer for mm-hmm. and nobody feels power or empowered to address so what can we do and that's the question i always ask myself at the end of the day what can i do besides being able to intellectualize this problem besides being able to talk about it what can i do am i going to bring about a change in my practice today with the people that i'm seeing today in my context today because it's that one drop in the ocean and if if mm. 10000 people do that if 40000 doctors start doing that will things not change so i think it is eventually about yes all these problems exist they exist still 50 years ago we had lesser doctors then we had no facilities then today it's different tomorrow it will be different and these problems will carry on india is a behemoth uh, what applies to delhi and gurgaon does not apply to bihar does not apply to mizoram or manipur does not apply to the south and i don't think there's a singular answer to healthcare in india that we have arrived at or will ever arrive at so i think i always come back to if i need to empower myself and not feel bogged down by this entire complexity what can i do today so i'm going to leave all of us and myself with that question thank what you. can thank i do you. today what can we do today thank you so much everyone thank you i think that's a lovely message each one of us doing their bit with that i thank you all for thank you meena having a great conversation